Thank you all for coming. And thanks very much to Stephen for organizing this wonderful two-week event. I mean, an event that really, I think, on the one hand, confronts one of the biggest challenges in science, the question of animal sentience, animal feeling. What is it for an animal to feel? What constitutes evidence of feeling? Which animals feel, which don't? How on earth are we supposed to tell? But at the same time, is also confronting, I think, one of the biggest challenges that we face as a society, which is what on earth to do about it? You know, how on earth do we reorient our relationship with animals from one that is primarily one of exploitation of their tissues to one that is primarily one of respect for their feelings? This is a talk that is going to try and bridge the gap between those two giant challenges. Uh, it's a talk that is based on a paper that I published last year in Stephen's journal, Animal Sentience, called Animal Sentience and the Precautionary Principle. Also based on a, a sort of more popular article I wrote for Eon magazine later that year, I really, really wanted to call this article Save the Crabs, but uh, the, that, that title was overruled tragically, by the editors. They went with, crabs and lobsters deserve protection from being cooked alive, which I thought was more direct and to the point, but not as good as save the crabs, surely. And also that's going to be based on some of the commentaries on, uh, on my animal sentience piece. Uh, one of the wonderful things about the format of Stephen's journal is that you get these, this call for open peer commentary, and the articles received 20 commentaries uh, as well as discussion in other, in other papers published elsewhere, uh, some of which I'm still thinking about how to respond to. And towards the end of the talk, I'm going to come on to what I'm currently thinking about some of those responses. I mean, the question motivating all of this stuff is basically this. I mean, for the purpose of formulating animal welfare legislation in that specific context, how much evidence and of what type should it take to convince us that an animal is sentient, where sentience is not meant here as a technical term with a technical definition, but one that just means capable of feeling, right? A term that we bring to science rather than one that we expect scientists to define for us. I mean, we put it this way. I mean, we think, think about a, a rock and imagine kicking the rock. It feels like nothing to the rock to be kicked. It's just nothing, just a complete blank. And then imagine you know, kicking a mouse or kicking a, a monkey. There's some objective description of what is going on there in terms of the mechanical force applied by your foot and the monkey flying across the room. But there's also something that feels like to the monkey. There's something it feels like from its perspective, from its point of view. That is, to me, an intuitively obvious difference, one that we can all grasp. Um, if you're sentient, if you're capable of feeling, there's something it's like to be you. There's something it feels like. If you're kicked, there's something it feels like to be kicked. Now, it gets interesting because not all cases are as easy as a rock or a monkey. Right? There are all kinds of cases in between. And this talk is going to be largely about some of those cases in between where we're really not sure what to say. Um, but by way of background, it's important to say a bit about, I mean, I'll say a bit about what motivated me to write these papers in the first place, why I think the questions are important. I'll also say what the main proposals in these papers are later on, before coming round to thinking about some of the critical responses to those papers. But motivating the whole thing is what I think is a neglected problem. I mean, if you ask people what they think the most serious challenges the world faces are, you know, in a totally unqualified way, what do you think the biggest problems we face now are? Things that will spring to mind for most people might include climate change, you know, might include uh, treatment of immigrants and refugees, things like that. Might include exactly what to do about Donald Trump, um, what to do about nuclear disarmament and the perpetual threat of nuclear war. All kinds of problems will come to mind. But I think only for a small minority of people would animal welfare feature on that list at all. But then even if we focus on the subset of people for whom 
Preventing animal suffering is really one of the great challenges we face in the world with the vast numbers of animals uh, potentially suffering at human hands. I think only a small fraction of that subset of people would mention uh, fish or invertebrates. But I think when we reflect a bit on the potential scale of this problem, we start to think, yeah, maybe this does actually belong on the list. Maybe it is as serious as some of the other challenges that we face. Because think about the numbers involved in commercial fishing. Jonathan Balcom's book, What a Fish Knows, is very uh, informative on this. He'll be giving a, a talk as part of this event. Also, the web, website fishcount.org.uk is very informative. It's incredibly hard to estimate the number of fish that are caught and eaten by humans annually, but they've tried on this website. Uh, they can try because there's estimates of the mass of fish. And if you know the mass of fish being caught, and if you know the typical weight of a member of a particular species, you can start to talk about numbers in a very sort of ballpark way. And they estimate that some, somewhere between one and three trillion fish per year are eaten by humans, of which most are caught in the wild, but 40 to 120 billion are now farmed. In addition to fish, think also about uh, decapod crustaceans. Decapods, things like lobsters, lobsters, uh, crabs, crayfish, shrimp, prawns, very diverse group, um, over 15,000 species of decapod crustaceans. Decapod mean, meaning it's, uh, ten legged. It's only one order of crustaceans, but incredibly diverse and widely eaten by humans too. Again, the numbers are incredibly difficult to estimate, but if you try, uh, what you come up with is something about 1.6 trillion. You might think, wow, that could be as many as there are fish, and that's surprising intuitively, I think. But you have to think about the size of some of these animals, you know, and the fact that a single prawn cocktail, for example, might include 20 to 25 individual animals that, that you're eating as a starter. And of these, again, farming is a huge part of the story, with about 200 to 400 billion farmed. Now, these statistics raise obvious environmental concerns. I mean, they raise fears about draining the oceans of its uh, life. They raise fears about sustainability. But setting those aside for a moment, they also raise fears about animal welfare, fears about what it's like for the animals involved. Because these animals are not well protected. I mean, this is not to say that sheep, cows, chickens, pigs, and so on are always well treated. It's not to say that there are no animal welfare issues concerning those animals. Of course, there are huge uh, welfare issues. But in those cases, you can, in the UK and European Union at least, point to legislation that is supposed to protect them, that is supposed to guarantee, if nothing else, a kind of humane slaughter involving stunning. Decapod crustaceans and fish, basically outside the scope of that legislation. I mean, decapods are entirely outside the scope of animal welfare legislation in most countries, including the UK. Uh, fish do receive a very, very minimal level of protection in the UK and EU, but it's of a fairly vague sort. There's a, there's a commitment to avoid unnecessary suffering with absolutely no specification of what it is to avoid unnecessary suffering, because the, the industry has lobbied hard against any attempts to specify exactly what unnecessary suffering consists in for fish. But when it comes to decapods, you're not even under a general obligation to avoid unnecessary suffering. You can, you can cause unnecessary suffering legally to a decapod crustacean if you want to. And this limitation on the scope of animal welfare legislation is reflected in some of the practices that are carried out commonly on these animals. Practices such as live gutting and live asphyxiation. In crabs, processes like live carving, where, I mean, it's pretty well known, live boiling, right, that many people, when, when preparing a crab or a lobster, will, will boil it alive. Um, but in the industry, in the processing of these animals in plants, it's also common for them to be carved live. So there, there need to be carved in some way for, for the retail market, and they won't, be, uh, they won't be killed or stunned before this happens. They'll just have bits 
lopped off them. And practices like osmotic shock, where you take a crab or lobster or fish that lives in salt water and you put it in fresh water so it dies through osmotic shock, are common, uh, and carbon dioxide poisoning. Entirely legal practices. What I think is that this creates a risk. Right? It creates a risk of a serious welfare problem that we can barely even estimate the scale of. Practices that, if the animal feels anything, are inhumane practices. But that brings us to the crucial question, right, which is whether they feel anything or not. Because if you think, if you think they don't, it's not clear that this matters ethically. Think here about rocks. Or think about plants. Many of us take for granted, uh, rightly or wrongly, that plants do not feel anything, that it's entirely reasonable to take a vegetable and put it into a pan of boiling water, because there's nothing it's like for the vegetable to be boiled. And if you think crabs and lobsters uh, are like that, if you think they feel nothing as they're carved alive or boiled alive, then it's not clear that there'd be any ethical problem with doing that, setting aside the environmental concerns I mentioned earlier. So of great relevance here is the question of whether these animals feel anything at all. And of particular relevance is the question of whether they feel pain in a suitably basic sense. Where, I mean, let's think about pain for a moment. I think when we talk about pain in the context of decapods, people working in this area really mean an aversive feeling that is associated with tissue damage. So there's a sensory component. There has to be some sensation of tissue damage that is felt by the animal. Right? And there has to be an aversive aspect to it as well. There has to be some aversive experience associated with that tissue damage. And the thought is that, well, when you have those things, that's enough to say there's pain in a basic sense, which is not to say that all of the features of human pain experience are present there. Uh, in particular, I mean, when, when we feel pain, we're sort of aware of ourselves as being in pain. We have a, a sort of self-consciousness. We're aware of ourselves as having been injured and being in pain. I don't think that that particular aspect of pain experience in humans is necessary to talk about pain in a basic sense of the word. Even if the crab is not aware of itself as being in pain, even if it has no kind of self-consciousness at all, the point is, does it have an aversive feeling when it's injured? Does it have what we might call a negatively valenced feeling? So what's the evidence here? What's the scientific evidence? Crucial at this point to look to the science and see what it says. People are often skeptical about uh, sentience in decapod crustaceans um, because of the small number of neurons in the nervous system, typically only around 100,000 compared to about 100 billion in the nervous system of a human being. I mean, the tiniest, tiniest sample of human nervous tissue would have more neurons in it than the entire nervous system of, of uh, decapods. There are times in the development of a fetus where it's you know, producing more new neurons in, you know, way more neurons in 30 seconds than the decapod has in its entire nervous system. But I think we should be skeptical of appeals to the number of neurons as if they completely settled the issue. Small nervous systems can do amazing things. Despite the fact that the decapods only have relatively uh, few neurons, evidence suggests that they still display behaviors that indicate some kind of centralized processing of information about noxious stimuli. And I'll talk a bit about the, the main sources of evidence that I found particularly striking when reading into this stuff. Um, first of all, there's evidence of motivational trade-offs. This evidence I mean, it's incredible how little studied uh, sentience in decapods is, actually. Almost all of the relevant data comes from one lab, uh, Bob Elwood's lab, Queen's University, Belfast, where, I mean, he's worked with crabs for decades. His story is that one time he went into a, a restaurant and uh, a celebrity chef called Rick Stein was also there, uh, and they got talking about crabs, because Rick Stein was saying, oh, you know, I love crabs. I love to, love to cook them. And um, 
you know, Bob Elwood said, oh, well, I'm, I'm, actually, a, I'm actually a scientist. I, I work on crabs in a, in a very different way. And Rick said, well, you know, there's something that's always bothered me about these crabs. Do, they, do you think they feel pain or not? And Bob Elwood just had to say, I have absolutely no idea. No one knows. And he was troubled by that and has spent the last 10 or 15 years or so trying to see what he could do to answer that question and has come up with some, what I think, pretty, pretty clever experiments. One important type of experiment that he's pioneered is about looking for motivational trade-offs, where the thought here would be that one thing that is indicative of centralized processing of information about noxious stimuli is that the animal is weighing up the seriousness of an injury against its other needs in deciding how to respond. Something intuitive about this, because it ties in with a plausible view about the function of pain for organisms that feel it. Pain is a kind of input to decision making. It's the kind of currency in which the need to nurse an injury is measured. You know, do, do, do I need to stop? Do I need to rest this limb? Or do I need to carry on with what I'm doing? Is it more important that I try and flee this predator than stop and nurse my, my injured leg? Pain is a kind of currency in which those trade-offs can be negotiated by a creature in, a, in an unreflective, implicit way. And so I would thought, well, do crabs do this or not? Do they trade off uh, noxious, information about noxious stimuli against their other needs? And his way of doing this involved hermit crabs. It's kind of ingenious. Uh, hermit crabs, there's a picture of them at the, on the first slide. They live in the shells of other, other crabs. And they're well known for having a kind of preference ordering over species of shell. You know, there are some types of shell that are better than others as far as the crab is concerned. So in the wild, they will trade up from a less preferred type of shell to a more preferred type. Uh, so Elwood was thinking, well, here is something that the crab does. You know, here's, what it, here's something it wants, so to speak, that it will, it will typically in the wild trade a less preferred shell for a more preferred one. And then the question was, how does a noxious stimulus uh, interact with that? His noxious stimulus involves electric shocks where... Here's a picture from the paper of what he was doing. He drills little holes in the shell of the hermit crab and puts in electrodes so that when the crab is in the shell, the crab gets a little shock. So it wasn't fatal for the crabs, but it was supposed to be strong enough to elicit a response. And the question was, will the crab trade off the, the need to leave the shell in the presence of an electric shock against the shell's quality and the need to hang on to a really good type of shell, well, it's got it. And his data suggests that they do. You know, if they're in the more preferred type of shell, they'll be less likely to leave when shocked than if they're in the less preferred type of shell. And in a similar way, he tried, uh, what, if the noxious, what, what if the thing to be traded off is a bit different? What if it's not the type of shell, but rather, what if there's the presence of the odor of a predator nearby? So you think the predators are things these crabs want to avoid, but they also want to avoid that electric shock they get while in the shell. Do they trade those things off in the sense that, well, if the odor of a predator is nearby, will they be more likely to leave the shell when shocked? And again, he showed that they are more likely to leave the shell when, uh, when shocked if there's no odor of a predator nearby versus when there is. So you see behavior like this behavior that seems to be going beyond a mere reflex response to the shock, that seems to be integrating information about the shock with information about the rest of the situation, what the other needs of the animal uh, are. And you sort of think, well, it's credible. It's credible that these behaviors are mediated by an aversive feeling, as they would be in us, as they would be in other mammals. Of course, it's also conceivable that they're not. Now, it's conceivable, of course, that there's just nothing it feels like to the crab when it's shocked. Second type of study Elwood has done involves uh, avoidance learning, conditioned place avoidance, this time with shore crabs rather than hermit crabs, where what, this, what, what he does here is that there are two types of shelter. Uh, 
um, the crab has to choose which shelter to run into. And sometimes in the shelters, it, it receives an electric shock. And Elwood shows that the crabs very rapidly learn to avoid places, avoid those shelters at which they've been shocked in the past. So again, to do this kind of learning and to do this quickly, as Elwood argues they do, shows some sort of centralized integration of information. Information about what happened at that place in the past. Information associating that place with a noxious stimulus. And uh, you know, changing behavior in response to that. Again, you can imagine this being mediated by an aversive feeling. It's credible. It's credible that the crab gets shocked, feels pain. That pain is a very salient feeling that is, uh, aids very rapid learning. I don't want to go where I, where I feel pain. That's credible. But it's also conceivable that there's absolutely no pain going on uh, there at all, of course. So what do we do in this kind of situation? That's kind of what fascinates me as a, as a philosopher of science. Inconclusive evidence, what do we do? Is there enough evidence, in particular, from these types of study to warrant a policy response? And so what I wanted to do was construct a framework that could help us with that kind of question. My thought, as the title of the paper suggests, is that this is a context in which we should apply the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle is well known in the sort of policy world, particularly environmental policy, where, I mean, here's a well-known formulation of it from the early 90s, from the U UN Rio Declaration. It says, where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, lack of full scientific certainty should not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. Principle that's been applied very widely um, to climate change, as, as you could clearly see, but also to things like neonicotinoids in bees. It's a pesticide that's linked to colony collapse in bees. Uh, in the European Union, they're banning this pesticide, not because there's conclusive evidence that it's causing colony collapse, but because there's credible evidence and it's a precautionary measure. So to comment on how to interpret a principle like this, I mean, you look at that quotation from the Rio Declaration, it is incredibly vague. I mean, what it is here is a kind of overarching, but admittedly extremely vague commitment to respond quickly to serious and developing threats in the face of inconclusive, uncertain evidence. This is a very kind of vague, you know, general imperative, something that will inevitably be accused of being toothless and meaningless unless it's augmented with some further guidance that is specific to the type of case at hand. In particular, I think that a principle like this needs to be augmented with what I call an epistemic rule and a decision rule, where the epistemic rule here, in general terms, the thought is that when there's the possibility of a causal link between human action and a seriously bad outcome, where it's important that the outcome is seriously bad so that this principle isn't applied wantonly. But when we think there's a serious threat developing, the idea is that we should set an intentionally low evidential bar in the policy-making context for accepting the existence of that link. If you think of neonics and colony collapse, the thought is that we shouldn't hang around waiting for evidence to pile up over decades, because by then the bees will already be gone. What we should do instead is set an intentionally low evidential bar so that the evidence we have now can, in principle, be enough for us to accept the existence of that link. And there also needs to be a decision rule that, in general terms, is going to say what happens when that intentionally low evidential bar is cleared. In general terms, it's going to say, as soon as that bar is cleared, take proportionate precautions to prevent that outcome without further delay where proportionate means they should be cost-effective and that they should be appropriate to the threat, that the cure should not be worse than the disease, so to speak. 
They should be appropriate to mitigating the risk in question, um, not making things worse. So they should be proportionate to the severity and plausibility of the seriously bad outcome. What justifies principles like this in environmental policy? Well, as the wording suggests, these principles are motivated by considerations of time. That they're not intended as general approaches to policy making. It's not supposed to be that every decision we ever make is, is somehow derived from a precautionary principle. It's a special tool for special circumstances. Circumstances where there's a danger of scientific uncertainty, delaying or even completely paralyzing a policy response to a serious threat. What's needed is some sort of procedural mechanism for timely responses to these serious developing problems that are outpacing the accumulation of evidence. Obvious how this applies in environmental cases, but also I think important to see that it can be applied in public health too and has been applied in public health. If you think there's a risk of, a, of human action creating a seriously bad public health outcome in the form of you know, releasing a dangerous pathogen into the environment or something like that, this sort of reasoning seems just as relevant there. And my proposal is that this sort of reasoning should also be applied in the context of animal welfare. That animal welfare problems too can have this character where a policy response is at risk of being perpetually delayed and paralyzed by scientific uncertainty. And there's a need to have a framework in place that allows us to respond quickly to the evidence that there is. That's the thought I develop in this paper. The proposal, okay, here's the general slogan, the general overarching imperative that I call the animal sentience precautionary principle that is modeled on this UN Rio declaration. That where there are threats of serious negative animal welfare outcomes, the absence of conclusive evidence regarding the sentience of the animals in question shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent those outcomes. Now, as in the case of environmental policy, this is vague, uh, admittedly. Yeah? Yeah, um, about the question of uh, pain. Could yeah. You, could you please stand up and say uh, About the issue of pain, I wanted to... I'm sorry? Oh, there's a microphone there, I think. It's... Okay. Hello? Does it work? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to know if um, the fear of dying or the fear of being hurt could be considered a pain, form of pain? It could be an experience with an aversive character. So wow. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't rule that out. I'm, when I'm talking about pain in this very basic sense, um, the fine distinctions we draw as humans among different types of aversive experience are not being made. Right, yes. So if you so if you're thinking is that is the is the crab feeling just pain or is it also feeling fear? You know, both of these are folded into this category of aversive experience. So they they you know pain is, is being used in a deliberately broad sense here. Yeah. Thanks. Um, right, so overarching commitment, but one that as in the environmental case must be supplemented must be supplemented by formulating an appropriately low evidential bar for attributing sentience in the presence of serious risks of harm. And also supplemented by giving an appropriate precautionary response that we should take when the bar is cleared. A response that can be defended as being proportionate to the plausibility and severity of the threat of harm. So that's where my proposals get more concrete and more specific. Here are the proposals. I mean, here are the proposals from my responses to the commentaries in, in the journal Animal Sentience. So the initial proposals were simpler. I've got these amazing uh, commentaries, huge amount to read through. A lot of it extremely constructive and helpful. And the result of reflecting on those commentaries was a revised set of proposals that incorporate various things suggested by those commentators. What you're getting here is the refined, slightly more complicated version. I'll highlight the important bits, though. Where is the proposed epistemic rule? 
that for the purposes of formulating animal protection legislation, we should say there's sufficient evidence that animals of a particular order are sentient. If there's statistically significant evidence obtained by experiments that meet normal scientific standards of the presence of at least one credible indicator of sentience in at least one species of that order. And then this is supplemented. I'd, yeah, I'll come back to the important bits of this in a minute, but I'll just talk about the extra clause here that if sufficient evidence by the light of this condition has been obtained for two separate orders, and if normal methods of phylogenetic inference indicate that conditional on the presence of sentience in those orders, animals of a third are also likely to be sentient, then there's sufficient evidence that animals of that third order are sentient. This clause was put in in response to the commentary by Cullen Brown, who pointed out that, well, this is all about particular orders of animal, right? including things like decapod crustaceans. But when you're looking at fish, I mean, when you're looking at the, the bony or teleost fish, for example, you've got 47 orders there, I think. Very, very difficult to find separate evidence for every single order. What you can do instead is look at the phylogenetic tree of the teleost fish and say, well, suppose that the, there's an indicator of sentience over here in the salmoniforms. And suppose there's another indicator over here in the supriniforms. Then, in light of that, if, you, if, if methods of phylogenetic inference tell you that the most likely explanation for sentience here and here is that there was sentience in the common ancestor here, you should be willing to attribute sentience as a, on a precautionary basis to all of these orders here. That's what the second uh, clause is all about. But I'm mainly going to focus here on the First one, because that's capturing really the core of the proposal. Some important things to, to highlight. I mean, there's a proposal here about the relevant grain of analysis, but it should be the order, not the individual species. To see why, I mean, think again about the decapods and remember that there are about 15,000 species. The thought is that if we insist on waiting for evidence specific to a species in order to protect that species, that's a recipe for paralysis, because we're never going to be performing Elwood-style experiments on 15,000 different species. I mean, he's done these experiments on, I think, two or three species. And the thought here is that that can be enough to protect an entire order of animals. But nor should we be generalizing beyond the order and saying, well, if you've got an indicator of sentience in one species, protect the entire animal kingdom. I mean, the proposal is that the order gets the grain of analysis right. Uh, for applying the precautionary principle. I also highlight the bit that says normal scientific standards. The proposal there is intended to rebut a common criticism of precautionary reasoning in general and also its application to animal welfare, which is that it implies a kind of relaxation of normal scientific standards. That it implies just saying, oh, anything goes. You know, you've, you've seen, anecdotally, you've seen a, a crab sounding like it was in pain. I mean, people say this. They say when you bore them alive, they, they scream out. But, but it's not screaming, of course. It's just steam uh, exiting the shell, like, like a kettle. Uh, that sort of anecdotal evidence is not enough. The claim is that there must be experiments that meet normal scientific standards, as I think Elwood's experiments do. But what's precautionary about this, why it's an intentionally low evidential bar, is that even though we're holding normal scientific standards, we're only requiring one credible indicator. Crucial here is to devise and maintain a list of what the credible indicators actually are. I propose motivational trade-offs and conditioned place avoidance as potential candidates. But a crucial part of filling in the details of this framework is to establish exactly what the list is going to be. But the claim is that only one is needed, and only in one species is needed to take to warrant a policy response. But then the next part of the proposal is about what form that response should take. And again, there's a kind of basic proposal and then some complications. The basic proposal is here that a proportionate response, when you have a cred credible indicator of sentience of this type, is to bring the order of animals in question within the scope of animal welfare legislation in some way. So the scope of animal protection legislation should include all orders of animals for which the evidence of sentience is sufficient. 
according to the standard of sufficiency outlined in the epistemic rule that I'm calling bar. The extra clauses, I mean, are that, well, what's meant here by including in the scope of animal protection legislation, uh, it shouldn't just, be a, shouldn't just be a case of paying lip service to those animals. It shouldn't just be a case of writing, writing down their names in an act, but it should entail that cost-effective measures must be taken to safeguard the welfare of those animals in any legislation relevant to their treatment in any domain of human activity. And there's also a clause for what to do in difficult cases that I'll come back to, where you know, some of the commentaries in response to this said, well, what do we do where it simply isn't agreed whether there is one credible indicator of sentience or not? Or what do we do where there's one but only one, and we really think we'd like to have more than one? The proposal is that in cases in which it's disputed whether an order satisfies the uh, bar or not, or in which there's evidence of one credible indicator of sentience but not evidence of two, it may be an appropriate response in these cases to commission further research into the question of sentience in those animals as a matter of high funding priority and to commit to review the status of that order after a short period of time with a presumption in favor of protecting those animals if no new evidence comes to light. Could you say a word or two about cost-effective? So where I'm understanding cost-effective, I'm simply meaning that there must be some procedure where the very, there's proposals put on the table about how to safeguard these animals' welfare. And there should be some process for the selection of the one that is, that is most efficient and most cost-effective. Is there a bar on that, too? What do you mean by is there a bar on that, too? Yeah. Yeah, well, the, it's, of course, it's a difficult, difficult can of worms in a way, in that it's um, almost any formulation of the precautionary principle in any context will include some clause along the lines of cost effectiveness or efficiency, um, which is simply to say that you've identified a risk, you've identified the need to mitigate that risk. And the precautions you take should do just enough to mitigate that risk and not impose additional prohibitive costs. And I think crucial to getting proposals like this accepted is to build in some sort of clause of that general type. So the thought would be if you've got a specific harm here that you've identified, for example, live boiling, um, a practice like live boiling, you've identified a serious risk of harm. A measure to safeguard the welfare of animals in a cost-effective way there is to ban that practice. Um, but in other cases, it may be, you know, I mean, what, what wouldn't be justified is sort of banning all, all eating of, uh, of those animals altogether, for example. That would be more than was required to uh, safeguard the welfare of the animals in, in response to that specific threat. That's the thought, and I think it's crucial, uh, even if you'd like to see more extensive protection than is strictly needed to mitigate the identified risk, it's crucial to have some sort of clause in there for proposals like this to command widespread assent, I think. And then the final bit is, is about when, when the evidence is disputed and that it may be appropriate to commission further research into the question rather than immediately protecting the animals. So what's the rationale for this particular proposed formulation of the precautionary principle? Well, the rationale is, is pragmatic. I don't think there's any problem with that. I mean, the pragmatic rationale for the grain of analysis here is that sep separate investigation of different orders of animal is feasible in practice, whereas investigating every single species of a given order is not. But when it comes to responsiveness as well, I mean, Important to realize here that many entire orders are severely understudied. The decapods, I would say, severely understudied. But also many orders of fish, we just know incredibly little because they're not standard model organisms in uh, contemporary biology. That's why I suggest that demanding multiple indicators for each order is a recipe for delay and paralysis, that we should be ready to act when there's just one. And third, consistency. It's crucial that the proposal does not require any lowering of normal evidential standards with respect to any particular indicator. 
So normal scientific standards are being applied across the board. We're not saying, well, there's lots of anecdotal evidence about these particular animals, so we'll, so we'll protect them, but there's, there's no similar uh, stock of anecdotes for these other animals, so we won't protect those. Applied to the decapods, what I think this proposal recommends is extending some form of protection to them on the basis of evidence from these Elwood-style experiments. But if we think about the case of decapods, I think they do satisfy the intentionally low evidential bar. I've emphasized that, of course, it's conceivable that there's no pain being felt when these animals make, make sophisticated trade-offs or when they learn to avoid a particular place. Of course, that's conceivable. But I think we have a credible indicator of sentience in these animals. And I think one is enough to protect the entire order. They should be brought within the scope of animal welfare legislation in some way, in a way that is proportionate to the identified threats to their welfare. So when it comes to specifics, I mean, the proposal is, think about risk. I mean, think about practices that on the assumption that these animals are indeed sentient, do, and they do feel something when exposed to noxious stimuli, whether it's through heat or mechanical trauma, uh, or anything else, if on the assumption that they were sentient, you'd regard that practice as inhumane, you'd regard it as causing severe and avoidable pain, then that practice should be banned or at least severely regulated, um, including those practices I mentioned at the beginning, practices like live carving, live boiling, eye stalk ablation. Um, I didn't talk about eye stalk ablation, but this is a standard practice in the aquaculture of prawns, that to get them to mature quickly and to get them to produce uh, offspring at a, at a regular fast rate. It's entirely routine that the eye stalks are cut off because the, the eye stalks produce an inhibitory hormone that uh, reduces the speed at which they spawn. So the eye stalks are cut off. A practice that I think is very questionable. Carbon dioxide poisoning and osmotic shock. There's a question Uh, Moses uh, so uh, basically, you, you say that all of these practices should be banned. Am I right? That's the proposal. That's the proposal, okay. So if you apply these concepts to basically every animal that we know are sentient, mm. uh, what do we do with cows, for example, that we know live in, you know, in packed groups that are, you know, the, obviously the, they're not really healthy in these places that they don't have freedom or anything. So yeah. what do you do with, with these kinds of situations? Do you just ban these, uh, these practices too? Feedlots. Well, uh, in a way, I mean, I, I don't think the, the sentience of cows is even really in serious doubt. So that wouldn't, re that wouldn't really be a case where a precautionary framework of this type was actually needed. Should be the case anyway that we regulate the welfare of cows to mitigate serious threats to their welfare. That should certainly be the case, and no nothing that I've argued for here um, well, adds to that in a way, because the case is already overwhelming, I think. Yeah, okay, because, for example, we know that they are being, um, I don't know the English word, uh, you know, traité pour pour le lait. How do you say that? Sorry? I can hear. Anyway, uh, when you take the milk out of the cow, that sounds horrible. But anyway, uh, you know, some cows, they, they, they do this to the cows very often and they get like, I don't know, they, they're not treated really well. I, I don't know the details about that, but we hear that all the time. So that's yeah, well, one practice it, that is not sort of good for their welfare, as, um, for example. I take it as obvious that a practice that causes serious and avoidable suffering in an animal that is the sentience of which is not in any serious doubt, should certainly be regulated. Um, and, and the details will depend on the case and whether it's really true or not that the practice is being done inhumanely. Um, but what, what the contribution is here is that I'm saying even in those cases where there is serious doubt, even in those cases where we can't say we're sure the animal is sentient, because it's in that difficult borderline region we should nevertheless, as a precautionary measure, ban practices that if the animal were sentient, would be causing avoidable pain and suffering. That's the proposal. Um, 
And I'll just spend a few minutes, perhaps, reflecting on some of the criticisms of that proposal. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is what I'm thinking about now, because there were these 20 commentaries. There's also been discussion of this paper outside of Stephen's journal. In particular, I mean, just last week, there was a paper by uh, a notable critic of decapod sentience, Ben Diggles. I mean, there are some very high-profile critics of decapod sentience. In um, 2010, the European Union produced a directive on the use of animals for scientific purposes in which cephalopods were protected across Europe for the first time. Um, so cephalopods, octopus, squid, cuttlefish, received a degree of protection in scientific research. A good thing, I think. But in the original proposals for that directive, decapods were also going to be included. That was the proposal of the uh, Animal Health and Welfare Panel of the uh, European Food Safety Agency. And that proposal was strongly resisted by very high-profile critics, real, real sort of leading figures of the biomedical establishment, particularly in the UK. Um, they produced a report you know, dismissing the evidence of decapod sentience, arguing that there's no, no serious evidence here at all. And decapods were taken out of that directive and a chance to afford some very basic protection to them was missed. But a lot of those high-profile critics don't really want to publish on the topic. They don't really want to come out in the open. Um, but what we do have is a, is a small squad of critics, including Ben Diggles and uh, Brian Key, who are very vocal in their criticisms. And it's worth mentioning some of those criticisms, particularly because I'm thinking about them right now and how to respond to them. Some of them are very detailed and focus on the methodology of Elwood's experiment. Right? And, I mean, I have to be, you know, my proposal involves upholding normal scientific standards. Right? So it's important to me that criticism of the methodology of these experiments is not ruled out of, of court, but is admitted and dealt with. Dickel suggests that in Elwood's experiments, He's not convinced that the electric shock is producing a nociceptive response, a response specific to tissue damage, rather than a kind of general irritating stimulus, he calls it, a just sort of excitation of cells that is not specifically linked to any nociceptive mechanisms. And it's true, I think, that Elwood's experiments so far don't, uh, don't show that the electric shock is producing a nociceptive response, I think. We, we, there is evidence that crabs and lobsters have nociceptors. There's evidence that they respond to electric shocks. But some of the middle parts of the picture explaining how the nociceptive mechanism mediates the response to shock, I think are yet to be filled in. Although I'd be interested to hear Elwood's responses to those concerns. There's also a concern that the predator odor experiment, well, it shows that an olfactory stimulus can interfere with the response to shock but doesn't necessarily show a sophisticated weighing up of needs. It could just be some kind of low-level interference of the two things going on at once. And, and because these are specific to the methodology of the experiments, I should leave it to Elwood to respond to them in detail. I just want to say that this is the sort of thing that that third clause of my proposal is intended to help us handle. You know, in cases where there's genuine scientific dispute about whether these experiments were, were good enough or not, whether they meet normal scientific standards or not. And if we think there's a real dispute there and not a kind of pseudo-dispute generated to distract attention, then this might be a case in which it may be appropriate to commission further research into the question of sentience in decapods as a matter of high funding priority and to commit to review its status after a short period of time. Now, for, for me, I think that would still be major progress to even get that. I mean, that is not happening at the moment. There's very, very little research on decapods. We have very, very little clue what is going on in them. Were this to be designated a matter of high funding priority, I think we'd rapidly see a lot more evidence than we have now. I just want to highlight that that part of the proposal is important and tells us how we should deal with cases where the science is itself in, dis in serious dispute. But then there's other parts of the Diggles paper that are raising broader concerns about 
the idea of applying precautionary reasoning in this context. And so I'm thinking about how to respond to those two. I mean, one of the claims Diggles makes is that there's no serious welfare concern regarding crustacean aquaculture, at least in scientific research. Um, on that, I mean, I, I just have to disagree uh, because, well, no, it, there's a focus here on scientific research. You might think even if there was no serious welfare concern in scientific research, there are plenty of concerns about the food industry, right? But even in scientific research, practices like eye stalk ablation are very common. And to me, at least, generate a serious risk. Diggles argues that they don't, but I'm not convinced. He says in the paper that eye stalk ablation procedures lasting more than two seconds may induce nociception. It says nociception does not imply pain, but that's somehow missing the point. The point, the point is not that there has to be some sort of entailment from nociception to pain to apply this principle. The principle is telling us what to do when we're not sure. It's telling us to mitigate serious risks. It seems to me there's a serious risk that practices of, of eye stalk ablation are, are painful for the animal. Another of the claims is that regulating crustacean welfare is, you, you know, is used to justify additional, possibly unnecessary constraints on scientific research that uses crustaceans. This is a version of what I sort of think of as the bureaucratic burden objection that I discuss in my original paper. Again, you might think, look, so this is only a point about scientific research. Even if you are not too bothered by that, there's still the food industry to think about. But leaving that aside, even focusing on the case of scientific research, I think it is important that concerns about the bureaucratic burden of having to care about the, formally about the welfare of a particular animal are not used as a reason to exclude entire orders of animal from the scope of that protection. There may be a case here for trying to streamline existing procedures in some way, um, particularly when dealing with very small animals that are extremely difficult to count. But there must be a better solution, I think, than allowing fears about bureaucracy to exclude entire orders of animal. Two of the points are quite subtle and interesting. Dickles also argues that if a precautionary principle is enacted too early, a catch-22 situation may arise in that restrictive requirements may hinder or even prevent high-quality studies looking into nociception and pain in these animals. That's something that does genuinely concern me, actually. The thought that nociception research and pain research itself ends up failing to, you know, becomes impossible to do because of ethics requirements that were themselves informed by that research. That is a concern. It's a concern that almost leads me to wonder whether there should be some kind of special exemption for research into animal pain and nociception, where it should not, certainly should not be free entirely of the normal ethical standards, but some sort of relaxation of those standards when the specific aim of the research is to improve animal welfare over the long term might be justified, or at least I'm contemplating it. And then there's another point about sunset clauses, where Diggle suggests if something like this is implemented, policymakers should be obliged to regularly review the scientific criteria and or include provision for sunset clauses for the withdrawal of taxa from protection if more scientific evidence becomes available at a later date, which invalidates the preliminary results used to trigger the precautionary decision. I don't think I actually disagree with that. And I think it's a potentially helpful suggestion for getting proposals like this implemented. That if a measure is a precautionary measure, it's reasonable that it should be firstly accompanied by some commitment to commission further research into this question as a matter of priority. And second, that it should be time limited in such a way as to allow the results of that research to show that there was no risk there after all. This seems important with cases like neonics. The possibility of a link between use of neonics and colony collapse in bees. Well, we should be doing more research into this. Right? And if further research shows that there really is no link there, there should be some measure for rolling back the legislation that we passed before. That seems entirely reasonable to me. I think it can be applied to this case too. 
we need to enter, enter into this with an open mind that it can't all be, it can't be a, a foregone conclusion that all the evidence must support the sentience of a particular species. We must be open to the possibility that we currently have some indicators, but in 50 years' time, we've done a lot more research. We turn out, we turn out, turns out that those indicators were not really there. They were false positives. And it does seem reasonable that legislation of a precautionary type does build in some sort of clause of that nature. So I don't find myself disagreeing with all of these criticisms. I certainly disagree. area. But criticisms that focus on trying to address genuine concerns that scientists working on decapods may have about the regulation of what they're doing, I think are reasonable enough to put those on the table for open debate. All right, so now I'd like to invite you to join this debate. I mean, I'm still thinking about how to refine these proposals how to respond to criticisms like these. I'd love to hear your input, so I'll stop there. Thanks. So what happens next? Okay. Would you like to... Well, people are queuing up, right? So uh, let's... Yes. Um, <clears throat> why not use just the uh, survival instinct as sufficient evidence of um, uh, sentience and pain perception? What do you mean by survival instinct? The, the, the bee, if you threaten it, if you want to catch it, it flies away. If you try to hurt an animal, you know, they won't stay there and get beaten up. You know, they'll, they'll try to flee. That's, that's, to me, sufficient evidence that you're hurting them. Right. Well, of course, uh, you say, to me, sufficient evidence. And I'm quite happy to accept that many of us in our ordinary lives will, will be quite happy to accept that bees or, or crabs or lobsters feel pain on, on the basis of uh, anecdotal observations of that sort. But the aim here is to try and convince policymakers to do something and provide a framework that will address the concerns of people who worry about uh, money. Yeah. Right. Well, yes, who have, who have reasons for opposing extensions to the scope of animal welfare law. The aim has to be to propose a framework that everyone can accept, so that even the skeptics think, okay, I accept that when the evidence meets this standard, that's enough. Uh, but that is going to, at the same time, allow protection to be extended as a precautionary measure, rather than allowing debates like this to be paralyzed permanently by, by scientific uncertainty. And that's what the, what the framework is aiming at, and that's why I think it's crucial that the bar is set in terms of particular indicators that can be tested for experimentally rather than the sort of everyday observations that informally convince many of us that, that uh, you know, bees, perhaps all animals feel pain, but, but that hasn't been enough to result in any welfare protection for those animals. So you think that an animal that wants to live is not sufficient evidence? Well, it depends what you mean by wants to live. I mean, well, you're trying to kill it and it defends itself. Well, I mean, the, the concern is that any li any living organism will meet that standard, but uh, it's no good to go to policymakers uh, anywhere and say, well, you need to protect every living organism. There needs to be some sort of framework for allowing specific extensions where there are specific risks of harm. I mean, that's what's motivating this. Thank you. Uh, well, should we, yeah? Hi, my name is Etienne. <clears throat> in order to lower the evidential bar mm. in proportion to the risk or the threat, we need to, to have uh, tools to measure the threat or the risk and, and means to uh, be able to 
know what is sufficient criterion for lowering the bar. So how, how do you manage it? How do you uh, measure the risk of the truth? What is the, 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 the risk of burning alive a sentient lobster or a sentient uh, right, so what is it that counts as a seriously bad outcome? I mean, that was the phrase I used, right? There must be serious harm, a seriously bad outcome. Um, and of course, I cited the numbers of animals involved to, to motivate that claim, that when you're talking about potentially inhumane procedures being carried out on trillions of animals or, or billions, to me, that meets the criterion for a seriously bad welfare outcome. So it's like a um, utilitarian uh, criterion, or? I don't think it has to be utilitarian. Um, the aim here is to produce something that people can unite behind from a variety of background ethical views. Um, and I, I think it's true that if you were a utilitarian, you would, you would have a background theory that vindicates the idea that inhumane practices carried out on trillions of animals is a very bad thing. But I don't think you, you in any way need to be a utilitarian to recognize the potential seriousness of that. Yeah, but I'm not sure I understand. If there is many, many more insects than human, it could be a bigger threat to sacrifice sentient insect than sentient human because there well, there's is no not more insect to sacrifice than human. I don't know how do you measure. There's the absolutely nothing here about weighing up animal lives against uh, human lives. There's nothing here that says a utility calculation has to be done, that we have to estimate number of humans and what they're worth. The, the claim is simply that there's a class of seriously bad welfare outcomes where everyone can agree that this is a terrible thing if the animals are sentient. So it's a common sense criterion? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's appealing to common sense. It's appealing to common sense to argue for something that is seemingly not common sense because it's uh, illegal in very few countries around the world. But I think it is common sense and it is compatible with a wide variety of background moral theories. Still over here, which, which side? Yeah. Who was there first? Um, <clears throat> it's a little persnickety. Uh, I just have... I'm interested in the way that, I'm taking issue here with the way that you kind of frame, the, um, frame your argument initially. Um, in particular, your choice of the use of the words epistemic and um, expression accept the link and the expression um, item B of, ba of bar, uh, there is sufficient evidence that animals of the order O3 are sentient. <clears throat> mm -hmm. and, um, the reason I say it's persnickety is because it seems like you actually have a different, you, you claim something different later in the, um, in the paper. Um, uh, surely we don't want to say that um, we actually accept the link. When we actually, you know, believe, you know, and this, or, yeah, yeah. or claim to have knowledge mm. that. Um, That's right, yeah, I mean, accept it really just means Treat as if, yeah. commit to treat as if. So, I mean, in a way, it almost seems like um, you, you could run the argument without uh, a bar, but just a more kind of robust for version of, of act or something. It seems like these are conditions for action. Yeah. The, the, the bar is not an epistemic one, it's a sort of decision making process bar or something. Yes, it's, it's intended as part of a decision-making process, that's right. And you're objecting to my use of the term epistemic here because I'm not suggesting that knowledge is what results when the, when the bar is clear. Or, or, um, or even actually belief. Yeah. Or belief, yeah. exactly. I'm using epistemic uh, when perhaps I should use evidential because it concerns evidence. But yeah, uh, yeah that's right. Yeah. Um, and the same would go for um, E even making the claim that they're sentient. Yeah. The same would go in what sense? Um, deciding that we should adopt the precautionary principle yeah. with regard to um, what looks like it could be, what look like they could yeah. be potentially very serious harms to these animals, mm. um, actually is compatible with not accepting the claim yeah. 
that um, there's something. Yes, to... that's absolutely right, yeah. I, I think you're right to be skeptical about the use of the term accept as well, um, when really, I mean, treat as if in this specific context. Uh, and you're absolutely right. I mean, that, that to me is, a, is an important attraction of this kind of framework that you can be a skeptic. You know, you can look at the scientific evidence and think, uh, well, my personal opinion is that the crabs probably aren't sentient. They probably aren't feeling anything like pain. And yet you could still think that and, and still accept that a precautionary response is justified. Yeah, and that, I, I think, is an I, important absolutely. point. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think this is a great... Um, yeah, it's a great argument. Back to this side. Yes, so I, I suppose your answer to my question will mostly be something along uh, these lines. Um, let's get this done and then we'll see. And yet, um, I'm wondering, bans are one thing, but enforcing them is something else. And I, I guess mm. this usually gets left to the lawmakers and the police and everyone else involved, and not yeah. the scientists necessarily. Uh, but um, that, do, you, do you even have any idea of how we would enforce a ban like that? Because you know, people have what they call traditions, culture. You, you have countries that would very reluctantly, I can think of many in my head, uh, even accept uh, an idea like that because you know, that's yeah, I mean, some countries mm -hmm. are trying it. I, I mean, live boiling, I think it's banned in Germany. It was recently banned in Switzerland. Some parts of Australia have laws on this as well. So it's starting. So there's some attempts, okay. yeah. And it is very hard to enforce, of course, because you can't police people's individual kitchens. Right. The, the aim has to be to target suppliers of the live suppliers. animals. Okay. Um, and, you know, I would be entirely on board with the idea that these animals should not be being transported and sold live to consumers at all. Um, and that, that seems like the, the right part of the chain to attempt to target, rather than individual consumer behavior. Okay, because I, I can easily think of an illegal market or things like that. Whenever there's a ban, there's always a Well, of course, yeah, I mean, market. banning heroin has is, is turned out to be pretty difficult. Yeah. Uh, you, you can never ban something completely. Uh, one might question whether laws of this type ever do any good, but I suppose, yeah, I mean, we, we, let's see what happens in Switzerland. And I, I, don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that bans like this will turn out to be ineffective. All right, thank you. Ah, this side, yep. Um, this may sound less charitable than it's intended, but um, the precautionary principle could be seen as just a rhetorical move. The same way rights language is a rhetorical move. It sort of reifies mm. stuff, uh, puts stuff in a language that has more bureaucratic traction, maybe. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any reason you think stating stuff that is common sense, like we should err on the side of not being monstrous, yeah. um, stating that in the language of precautionary principle is any less vulnerable or puts the debate into a, a framing that's any less vulnerable to um, bad faith arguments. Like I could say, well, let's apply the precautionary mm. principle to the tr potential tragedy of lost fishing jobs and starving fishermen's children. And let's make sure that we follow this well-stated, clear, uh, procedure with bars and with decision mechanisms. Mm. Is there, does it do the rhetorical work that absent any clarification, uh, we would want to get out of this move? Does it do the rhetorical work? Is it less vulnerable to exploitation as compared to other ways of stating these? Um, I would less hope vulnerable to exploitation? Principles. Well, I, yeah, I mean, that's an open question, but the, the aim is, yes, it should be. Part of what motivated me to write about this was reading the debate that happened when there was that EU directive and cephalopods were included and decapods weren't, which I found quite fascinating. Um, the EU is, is, you can see all the documentation on the, on the website, and there was also in the UK, there was a House of Lords hearing 
that is freely available. You can read the transcripts, see what was said. Um, and I find it very illuminating because there was a lot of stuff that seemed to me to be frustratingly hand-waving of the type of, along the lines of, well, there's scientific evidence both, both ways, it's not very convincing, there's a, there's, a, there's a bit, but how do you really know? How, how, do, you, how do you adjudicate a question like this? We, we don't really know one way or the other whether these animals are sentient or not. Um, followed by some stuff about, you know, think of the bureaucracy. Um, and I really thought it was, this was the wrong way to settle an issue like that. It really shouldn't be, well, the scientific evidence is inconclusive, so let's forget about that, think of the bureaucracy. It should really be, no, we need, we need a framework here that all sides can agree on for actually managing the scientific uncertainty and actually saying how are we going to resolve issues like this in the future in a principled way. So the, the proposal here is, look, here is a way to resolve issues like this in a principled way. And I've tried to formulate it in a way that even the, the reasonable skeptics could, could get on board with. Um, and if that works, that would, be a, that would be progress, I think. That assumes that good faith skepticism is... Yeah, yeah it assumes, it yeah. assumes that the, there, are, there are good faith skeptics, that's right. And um, that they're doing the bulk of the work in impeding an yeah. enlargement of moral concern. Right, I mean, there's a cynical view that would say the... The, I mean, in this case, in the House of Lords hearing, it was really the, the biomedical establishment and the, the scientific research establishment. My general presumption would be those people were acting in good faith and could be, could be skeptical of that. But this, this framework does, is premised on the idea that people are coming to these debates in good faith, but without a systematic way of uh, translating them into action. And if that's true, then this sort of framework will be, will be helpful. And if it's not, then I guess it won't. Okay, yep, and then we can uh, go back to questions. During uh, the previous talks, we have uh, Dr. Michael Hendricks from McGill, and we also have with us Greg Michelson, also from McGill, who will be commenting tonight. Sure, I can start. Um, I guess I, maybe I'll just direct a couple questions to, to Jonathan. Um, it's pretty thought-provoking, um, and one of the one of the criteria you bring up, this is going to sound a little strange to say, but uh, sometimes I'm, I'm really uh, leery of, of deploying scientific evidence as the standard in some of these policy and legal uh, arenas, because scientific evidence is, is very provisional and it changes. You know, 75 years ago, scientists would have told you about all the differences in criminality among different groups of people yeah. or these kinds of things. But if you think so of climate change or neonics, yeah, I think so responsiveness to scientific evidence is absolutely crucial. That's true. So I'm, I'm not making a blanket statement, mm. but I feel like it, when we have a phenomenon like sentience where I actually don't think there is or possibly can be a hard biological definition of what it is, and so we choose uh, proxy behavioral assays that mm. we feel like at this point in time with current understanding might indicate it, I worry that you, you set yourself up to be in a situation where uh, so we decide motivational trade-offs or evidence of sentience. So then what do we do if there's credible scientific evidence that slime molds do motivational trade-offs? Do we decide then that slime molds are sentient or do we decide that that wasn't a good criterion for sentience? And then do we have to yeah. retroactively reconsider Absolutely, everything? Absolutely, yeah. And there's no recipe here for resolving all debates in that area. Uh, the proposal relies on there being a list of credible indicators that can be revised, um, and, it, and there's no recipe for what to do when one of the indicators is, is called into question. Yeah. But, I mean, the thought is that consensus on this issue shouldn't be impossible. Yeah. Right. But I, I feel, so I agree, so the scientific evidence has a role, but unlike in climate change where we're directly measuring the climate changing, here we're trying to 
basically make a semantic definition for what we think sentient is, which is, is partly a scientific question, but is also uh, a moral question and one that- Well, we, we, know what, we know what sentience is, and what is open to debate is the credible indicators. Right. Right. Um, I'm not sure that, we know what sentience different? is. <laughs> you know what it is to feel. I know what it is to feel, but I don't know what it is to measure it in another organism. Right, the, but that, uh, that's asking about the indicators. Right. I think similar debates existed in the case of climate change, that we, we know what it is, and there's room for disagreement about how to model it or measure it. Um, yeah, and th th there's, no, there's absolutely no recipe here for resolving all of the scientific debate. It's a proposal about how to move from scientific literature that tells us, that ha gives us good quality evidence of credible indicators to a policy response, but it doesn't tell us how to decide exactly what the credible indicators are, because that's something that I, you know, I just certainly don't at the moment have an answer to and requires further work. So I, I was going <clears> to <throat> talk for a little longer, if that's... Yeah, of course, okay. uh, maybe just speak into the microphone. Sure. Is it working? Great. So uh, thank you to the organizers uh, for the opportunity to um, comment on this. I learned a lot from both the target and the response articles as well as your talk now, Jonathan. Um, and uh, I, I especially liked the way that uh, you dealt with a fairly abstract issue but with very concrete examples that helped us think about it. And, and I've, you know, I appreciate learning a lot more about our decapod um, fellow beings and what we're doing to them, etc. cetera. Um, I also read several of the commentaries and I guess my um, my comments are going to respond both to um, your article and a cu couple of the <coughs> commentaries. I especially appreciated Joel Mark's um, commentary for stressing what is actually the main impact that human beings are having on sentient animals right now, and that is that we are massively reducing their numbers. So vertebrate populations worldwide have, uh, will have plunged by an average of 67 percent by 2020 according to the uh, World Wildlife Fund since uh, 1970. Um, and invertebrates are doing even worse <coughs> as other scientific articles are, are, are showing. One indication of this is that um, if we go driving in the countryside, it used to be the case that you'd have dead bugs all over your windshield. We don't have that anymore because insect populations, vertebrate populations, et cetera, are collapsing worldwide. So as, um, as Marx put it in his uh, commentary on your article, he said, for me, animal ethics is a very simple matter. It's about the onslaught by human beings on all other animals in their natural state in the wild. Encroachment and domestication are the culprits. <clears throat> and, and he clarifies that one of the main results of encroachment is this depopulation that I've uh, talked about. So I actually have several questions to ask, but I think I'm gonna limit myself to two of them, just because I'm only sp supposed to speak for about uh, five minutes. Um, and if there's opportunity during subsequent discussion, uh, maybe some of those uh, will come up. Um, and these both have to do with uh, this issue of harms done to wild animals by, um, by humans. Um, and in particular, uh, what I'd like to do is, is um, ask a couple questions that uh, you know, uh, stem from your paper and this commentary on it, but, uh, but to sound the alarm about the harm that will be done to wild animals if we, if we heed a certain strand of animal ethics that I call anti-sentientism, uh, according to this strand, the collapse of wild sentient animal populations that I just referred to is actually a good thing. Why is that a good thing, that wild animal populations are collapsing worldwide, rather than a bad thing, as Marx uh, asserted? It's because according to this strand of uh, animal ethics, most wild animals live in what one of them calls a natural hell, uh, that it would be better never have been to, uh, never to have been born into. Um, so as a, as a 
preface to that issue, I, I want to um, talk about something that you guys were just touching on, and that is, what is the definition of, of sentience? And I think you provide uh, a reasonable one on page two, or at least a reasonable working definition on page two of your paper, when you say, it usually refers specifically to subjective experiences with an attractive or aversive quality, uh, such as experiences of pain, suffering, pleasure, frustration, anxiety, fear, happiness, and joy. I mean, that's sort of sentience in the narrow sense. I right. would say. Sentience in the broad sense sure. is feeling anything. Right. Yeah, yeah, and I, th I think you, you clarify that uh, yeah. pretty nicely. Um, and your target and response articles go into some detail about research on pain and suffering, and that's also what has been focused on in, in the talk and discussion so far. So my first question is, what about those attractive or positive uh, feelings? pleasure, enjoyment, satisfaction, et cetera. Um, are they equally important as pain? And I think maybe they should be, because since you're talking about serious negative animal welfare outcomes in your version of the, of the precautionary principle, um, one kind of negative outcome could be preventing the pleasure that a bunch of animals would other by, otherwise be experiencing. So, so I guess what I'm suggesting here is that humans could just as easily be preventing a whole bunch of positive experiences that animals would otherwise have as causing them to have negative experiences. Um, so yeah, the, the, the general question is what about those positive uh, effective states? And in particular, would you, um, you know, I'm not, I don't work in this field, but, but I'm wondering if you would have anything to say about the state of scientific research on these positive sides of, of sentience. So that's the, the first question. Um, and then the, the, the second question <clears throat> has to do with a, a different response to your paper by um, a postdoctoral researcher named Paez uh, that you responded to um, but I think you ignored the main thrust of his call to protect wild animals. So one of the responses to the, the tar target article um, said we need to think not only about domesticated animals and uh, et cetera, but, but also wild animals. And I guess decapods would, they're, 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 yeah. mo most, most of them are, are, are wild. Um, and you say that Paez ra raises the issue of wild animals. Should we attempt to protect sentient animals in the wild or not? My answer is that the treatment of any sentient animal in any domain of human activity should be regulated. And that yeah. would certainly cover um, the, the case of uh, the decapods you were talking about. But I guess the reason I'm saying you're ignoring the main thrust of his point is that what Paez said is that human non-activity is an even bigger problem. As he puts it, quote, although wild animals are harmed by human action, Human non-interference with wild animals can be arguably even more harmful for them. Because of the natural harms hum non-human animals undergo, most of them live lives of net suffering. So he's saying we're actually doing more harm by not going out and stopping all this suffering. We're, caught, you know, we're responsible for more harm than when we boil lobsters alive and you know, do all the other things that, that, that you're talking about this. So the second question is, um, what do you think of this? Should we be passing laws to make us interfere with wild animals, uh, you know, going, up, going, about their, going about their business? Um, and I guess, I think I might have one, one more minute. Um, just a little bit on that general topic, because Paez is not only making this claim himself that you know, wild animals out in nature are experiencing a natural hell, but he's drawing on uh, some other authors who've been making this claim over the past few years. Um, and he's, he's stating it as if it's an established fact. But it seems to me that it's based on a gross overemphasis on suffering, the negative side of sentience, and a, and a gross underemphasis on, on the positive side, the pleasure, the joy, the satisfaction, as I argue in, in, in a paper that's currently under review. 
Um, for example, all of the sources that, that Paez cites talk about pain a lot more than pleasure, from anywhere from you know, talking about pain two times as much as pleasure to talking about it seven times as much. Um, like, likewise for suffering uh, over enjoyment. Um, and your target article also uh, mentions the word pain 15 times and, and pleasure only once. Anyway, for, j just to end it with a, a different perspective from Darwin's Origin of Species, um, at the end of uh, the third chapter on the struggle for existence, he says, when we reflect on this struggle, we may cons console ourselves with the full belief that the war of nature is not incessant, that no fear is felt, that death is generally prompt, and that the vigorous, the healthy, and the happy survive. So what about pleasure and what about um, interfering with wild animals? <clears throat> Thanks, yeah. Uh, two very interesting questions. I mean, I suppose the, the short answers, I mean, the aim of this particular kind of framework is, is, is not to make the lives of animals more pleasant or joy-filled or anything like that. It's aimed at the mitigation of risks of seriously bad outcomes. Uh, and that, that's, that's, whether you see it as a limitation or a strength, this is just true of all precautionary principles. It's part of what the, what the type of reasoning here is about. It's about mitigating risks of very bad things. So it's just as true in the environmental law case that what, it, what it's telling us is it's justifying precautions to mitigate the risk of climate change or colony collapse in bees. It's not saying, it's not giving us any advice at all on how to make the lives of bees more pleasant. That's just not, not the aim of that particular type of framework. Um, even though, of course, I, I do agree that the, the positive, positively valenced experiences of animals do matter, uh, but they're just not the target of this type of framework. But, but shouldn't they be, since preventing pleasure should be seen as a harm, just as causing pain, don't, don't you think? Uh, no, not in this sense, I don't think. When I talk about serious harms, I think, I think you're right, that's something that merits further, further teasing out. Um, but I think the, the foregoing of pleasure is not a serious harm in the relevant sense. Hmm. I think there is a distinction there. Um, right, and then the second question was related to that. Right? It was about whether whether we could be obligated to intervene positively in the lives of wild animals, as opposed to simply regulating, placing restrictions on human activities that do things to them. Um, and again, I think my response is just that that's not the sort of thing that this type of framework is is aimed at doing, in that. I don't, think, I don't think it's some, somewhere for the law to step in to mandate a certain kind of positive assistance, I would say. Um, I think the, the, the focus has to be on regulating the things we currently do to animals, not on creating obligations to do more things. I, don't, I just don't know how that would work. I don't know who I, the obligations would fall on or how it would be enforced. I, I think you're right, but just to clarify, I'm. I, I guess I'm, I'm envisioning humans doing something that's actually preventing animals from pe feeling, having positive experiences that they would otherwise have. In other words, it, it's not only the case that humans can, can cause pain to other animals, but we can diminish you know, their positive experiences. And, and should we, shouldn't we be regulating that as well? Uh, certainly this framework is very explicitly directed at serious harms where I was certainly not thinking of that as involving the foregoing of, of pleasure. I don't know what sort of examples you have in mind. Um, well, at least if we are interested in, in um, like the sum of pleasure, if, if we seriously depopulate a species and you know that species right. 
on average, experiences net positive well-being, uh, then, then, then we are right. basically, you know, wiping out okay. a bunch of... So you're imagining a case yeah. where these animals are sort of humanely euthanized, they feel no pain, but there's fewer of them and, and therefore less, less pleasure in the world as a result of human action. Uh, I hadn't really thought about that. Um, my sense is that the aim here is to produce something that can command widespread assent by being relatively conservative in its aims. And one of the ways in which it's relatively conservative is that it's saying, let's focus on the things that everyone can agree would be serious harms on the assumption that the animals were sentient. Um, and that's why I just don't see the sort of cases you're thinking of as falling into that category. Um, I think it just, it wouldn't be an unambiguous case of serious harm. It would require a specific way of thinking about harm on which deprivation of pleasure counts as a harm, which would not be universally uh, supported. I think we have some questions. Okay, so uh, it's to come back to uh, the argument uh, we had earlier about cows. <laughs> First of all, I, I agree with all the propositions you made today. It's, it's, it's obvious that we have to, to, to care for the welfare of basically every animal. What you talked about today was uh, decapods and crustaceans, yeah. but I guess if you apply this concept to them, you have to apply them to mammals, right? Yeah. And uh, the example I gave earlier was not about free roaming cows. This is obviously fine. But like the, the farm factories where they're all packed up and they can't move, they're in an enclosure where they can't do anything. Yeah, yeah. As Mary Lee Gensel would say, the, the speaker was there earlier, animals need space, they need enrichment, and they need social interaction. Some, some cows, for example, they get their uh, kid taken away for them to produce milk, but the, yeah. the, the, they lose the, this relationship, they lose, they, they, they have this, uh, this, you know, they, they panic when they see the kid taken away. Uh, so, and how do you apply, you know, as I said, I agree with all of that, but how do you apply that in practice? For example, not everybody can become vegan, but you have to, to give space to these cows, for example, but we're already out of space or we have to change the infrastructure. So there's, I think there's this bigger picture of how do you apply the law and change basically everything so that the animals can be well. And I, I mean, all of the animals that we are working with. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. I mean, it's, uh, of course, I entirely agree that there are, there are sources of serious ethical concern in the way that cows are farmed. Um, despite that, I mean, I'd emphasize again that that's just not the kind of case to which this principle here uh, applies, because I don't think it's a case in which doubts about the sentience of the animals is being used to uh, prevent change. I mean, I think that the obstacles to change are different in the, in the case of cows and other mammals. Um, of course, we should, we should still think about those cases. Uh, I suppose I'm less convinced than you that it's not possible for everyone to be vegan. Yeah. Or, or at least, okay, I mean, it's not necessary for everyone to be vegan. I mean, it's certainly possible for everyone to substantially reduce the amount of meat they consume so that the current rationale of saying, well, we have to intensively farm these animals because people want meat. They want meat every day, they want meat at every meal, they want three different types of meat. Yeah. So that, that rationale is, is no longer present. Mm -hmm. But the public opinion has to change quite drastically for that to happen, and if you want to change the law, public opinion has to, be, has to support this, this. That's right, that's one of the obstacles to change in that case, yeah. yeah. And you know, in certain countries it might be easy to do, but in Canada, for example, Looking at the long term is often difficult. If you see, for example, Justin Trudeau with the pipe, pipelines, you know, they don't think in the long term. So for the short terms of, you know, changing the infrastructure of, for example, for the cows or anything, that might be a big challenge in Canada, for example, if you understand it what would. I mean. I'm sure it would. I mean, yeah, the, the more 
the more heavily invested a, a, a national culture is in the farming of a particular type of animal, the stronger the resistance will be to reform uh, in the treatment of that animal. Uh, similar issues arise in the case of decapods. I mean, there's certain parts of the world that, um, you know, for reasons of culinary tradition, are very heavily invested in, in the sort of live boiling of decapods. And that's where a lot of the criticism of proposals like mine comes from, places like Maine, Queensland. Um, that's just an inevitable part of this, I think. And, and the aim is not to disrespect people's culinary traditions, but just to say they can be carried on in a more humane way. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for the uh, excellent presentation. I have a comment, and then I have a, a, a quick question. Uh, with respect to the issue that was just discussed earlier about uh, enjoyment of animals, mm. in the legislation in Quebec, in Quebec's Animal Welfare and Protection Act, uh, there's a section that specifically provides that the owner or the custodian of a, of a cat, a dog, or a horse must provide that animal with stimulation, socialization, and environmental enrichment mm -hmm. uh, with respect to its um, biological needs. So there, so, so there, there yeah. are, um, there is legislation that's emerging that's recognizing that, that principle. Yeah. Uh, my question, again, is, is uh, with respect to the law. Um, in Quebec, for the past 400 years, uh, animals were treated as property, which meant that you could dispose of the animal as you saw fit, including the total destruction of the, uh, uh, of the animal. Mm. Um, after 400 years of this legal regime, uh, in 2015, December 2015, the law changed in Quebec. And I'd just like to read you, it's very short, uh, what our civil code says, and I'm interested in getting your, uh, your reaction. So it says, animals are not things, okay, to make sure that it's clear that, that they're not considered things as they were as, uh, under, in terms of being property. And then it goes on to say, <clears throat> they are sentient beings, okay, they are sentient beings and have biological needs. So what I'm curious about is how do you reconcile this legal principle that they are sentient beings in light of what yeah. you've just discussed and the fact that the legislator says they have biological beings. They have biological needs. Just to give you um, uh, a, a one last note, biological needs are defined in terms of three criteria in, in our legislation. It means the basic physical, the basic physiological, and the basic behavioral needs. So mm -hmm. I, I'm a lawyer, and I'm interested in, in, um, in you sharing your thoughts on this legal principle. They are sentient beings and have biological needs. What does that, what does that mean to you uh, in light of your, your research? Well, I'm certainly in favor of developments of this general type, the, the enshrining in law of animal sentience. Um, there's, in the Lisbon Treaty in the EU, there's a clause of that, this type, saying animals are sentient beings. Uh, and in the UK, there are, there's an attempt sort of underway to get something similar enshrined in UK law after Britain leaves the EU. Uh, and there's ongoing debate and consultation about what form that should take. Um, and some people say, well, this is completely meaningless if you just say animals are sentient beings, but then there are no practical consequences of that. But, um, I mean, and that's right, there must, be, there must be some clear tying of recognizing an animal as sentient to clear obligations to safeguard its welfare. And that's part of what I try to build into this proposal. Um, but at the same time, I do think it's, it's very significant just to have it written into law that animals are not, even if they are owned, they're not just owned, but they're also sentient beings. That's crucial. And it's crucial to do it in a way that is very clear about what an animal is. Uh, I think in U UK Animal Welfare Act, 
what they don't say is we defer to scientists on the question of what an animal is. What, what they say is an animal is any vertebrate. Um, but then in, in some of the regulations, cephalopods are also covered. Um, and I think there needs to be a framework of, of the general type that I've set out here for saying that shouldn't be just set in stone. We can't just define animal as vertebrate and never protect any invertebrate in ever. There needs to be a clear procedure for getting the scope right by extending it to some invertebrate orders as a precautionary measure. And I don't think I was, I was clear enough. When, when we say that they're sentient beings yeah. and they have biological needs, right. does the use of the term biological needs coupled with being sentient, does that change something from, from your scientific point of view? Does it change something? I mean, you, you make it sound like there's some sort of tension between those ideas, but, but I don't think I see the tension. Um, I think the point is that all living organisms have biological needs, and when the, when the, when the organism is also sentient, those needs are of ethical importance, because the, it's reasonable to think the thwarting of those needs will be accompanied by pain, suffering, aversive experiences. Uh, so I can see why both, you know, both, both matter because when the, when the organism is sentient, it's, it's the needs of that animal that you need to respect and consider. Thank you. I think one thing maybe that gets across is we've mostly been talking about pain and suffering, but maybe this is trying to include deprivation of recognized needs as a form of suffering on par with, with acute pain. Yeah, I mean, welfare is certainly a very complicated property, including various positive needs, perhaps the, the need to express certain types of behavior, not just avoiding suffering. Nevertheless, this particular framework is, is aimed at preventing serious harms that, that do cause suffering. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Monica. I'm from Brazil. And I traveled a lot to be here now. <laughs> and my question is uh, an indirect uh, question for your work. Um, do you know Francis Creek Memorial Conference of cognition, uh, animal cognition, that happened uh, 20 to uh, 12? Is and this the Cambridge Declaration on yes, Consciousness? Yes. And I would like to know uh, if did it, this event had any rel relevance? Uh, did it have any effective influence in the field of animal welfare? And if you, do you think that it had uh, any relevance? And if yes, why? And if no, why too? And the 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 role the the role of philosophy at yeah. the, in this contest of a manifesto uh, by scientists is, um, I don't know if it's clear my, my question. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to make generalizations about the impact the Cambridge Declaration has had. I mean, it's had, I think it's had some positive impact in that it helps that sets the terms of the debate, and I think we've seen over the last five to ten years, it feels like we've seen a shift in the debate so that people are talking more about invertebrates and fish and cephalopods, and there's more of a, a view that, look, mammals and birds are pretty settled. Um, it's, it's not as reasonable as it once might have been to deny that mammals and birds are sentient. Uh, and the, the Cambridge Declaration, to the extent that it, despite being pretty vague, it represents an attempt to form a consensus around that general type of view. That seems like a good thing, and it helps, helps move the debate on. Uh, but I don't, I, I don't think it's led to direct legislative changes. There has been the ex some extension of protection to cephalopods, but not for that reason. Uh, and then the other question was, what, what do I see the role of philosophy in all, all of this as? 
And well, what I hope is that philosophers here can play perhaps a, a somewhat similar role to the role philosophers played in helping get consciousness studies off the ground in the 80s and 90s, where philosophy is this strange kind of subject where we just sort of sit outside other disciplines and to some extent try to bridge the gaps between them. You know, when, when questions are deemed too foundational, too conceptual, too remote from empirical work to be addressed scientifically, that's where philosophers like to step in and say, look, we can, we can help with this. Um, it seems to me as though the animal sentience research is emerging in an exciting way. It's emerging as an interdisciplinary community of scholars in a similar way to the way consciousness studies emerged a few decades ago. And philosophers can be the glue almost. We can help people from different disciplines talk to each other, develop shared conceptual frameworks, and hopefully also develop, help develop frameworks like this that are intended to bridge the gap that sometimes seems unbridgeable between the science and the law and policy. Um, my question is, we talked a little bit, or you talked rather a little bit, uh, about the cost-benefit aspect uh, of the analysis earlier. And my question is, um, if we are doing this cost-benefit analysis from, um, from a human perspective in terms of what is, um, you know, we don't want to give them as much protection as would, you know, take something away from us. And I think someone uh, argued that in the sense that they were saying uh, we wouldn't want to, for example, um, add any obstacles to doing research on crustaceans. Um, do you think that this, that by setting such a, a low standard so that even skeptics can kind of accept this, this theory, mm -hmm. is that in some way um, creating, like, or negating the precautionary, the protection that is supposed to be afforded when applying the right. precautionary Right, so you're getting principle. to some of the delicacies of cost effectiveness. Uh, I mean, the crucial thing is that some, some precautionary measure must be taken. I mean, it can't be that considerations of cost lead you to say, uh, oh, you know, we, we could mitigate this risk, but it's too expensive to do so now, so let's not do anything. That's supposed to be ruled out by the precautionary principle. I mean, otherwise you're not, you're just in the realm of standard cost-benefit analysis. You're not, in, you're not applying the precautionary principle at all. Um, so the idea is the precautionary principle forces you to take some precautionary measure that is proportionate to the threat. And considerations of cost-effectiveness only come in at the stage of working out what measure that should be. It shouldn't be something that does, takes more measures than are necessary to mitigate the risk. It shouldn't be the most costly of the available options. It should be the, the least costly in other respects. So in, in the case of decapods, I mean, that plays out in an interesting way that sometimes people, one of the counter arguments to regulating the use of decapods in scientific research is that, oh, you know, that would be counterproductive. All that would happen is that the scientists would ship out to China and they'd go and do their, their work on decapods in America or China or somewhere else. Um, but in response to that, you can say, well, that's not, it's not an argument against the precautionary principle. That's an argument against the data that's pointing out a risk of measures that involve excessively burdensome regulation not being cost effective not cost effective because they, they end up making the problem worse than it was. There needs to be a careful thought put into making sure the measure is not making the problem worse, is actually addressing it, and is only, is, is only doing enough to address it and not far more than that. And that's the sort of considerations that fall under the heading of cost effectiveness. Hi, my name is Najet Sarab. And first of all, thank you for this amazing presentation. And uh, so my question is, um, I have a problem with the wording of the question, are any species or animal uh, sentient? So shouldn't be instead, uh, should those, any creature be sentient, human beings able to feel that and see and feel it and have um, 
Well, for example, I think about intelligence. There are many forms of intelligence, and we, if we take aside any academic achievements, diplomas, and any kind of achievement, it takes someone intelligent to notice somebody else's intelligence. So anytime someone tells you you're intelligent, they're saying, first of all, I am intelligent. So it wouldn't be the same with uh, sentience, with feelings. Uh, the fact that we cannot prove uh, that animals our sentence should be the problem, us not being able to f feel it and see it as humans. What was the question, sorry? Uh, the wording of the question, uh, are any species or any animals sentient? Should be like, should they be sentient? Are human beings able to uh, feel it and see it? Because it doesn't have an organ. Uh, I'm still not sure I get, understand what the question is. That you can see other, other minds are all, which is just put it in other Right. Well, that's certainly the case, yeah. That it, that it, it, we, we never experience the feeling for ourselves. Uh, we have to find ways of inferring it. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's no getting around that. And there's no certainty in this area. And that's what the, this whole framework is is about. The, the idea is that we can't eliminate uncertainty, especially in cases like crustaceans, where if they're sentient, their sentience has probably evolved completely separately from ours, common ancestor of the vertebrates and the arthropods, uh, may well not have been sentient. So we're dealing with something that is underpinned by completely different mechanisms to sentience in mammals. There can be no certainty in this area. All, all we can have is a framework for managing our uncertainty, which is what I'm proposing. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I have a comment more than a question, but uh, I just wanted to um, answer about, like the because the, the question of uh, having laws that are hard to implement or hard to enforce uh, and that question got raised a few times. It's like, yeah, it's really hard to like enforce those. But I think there's another other use to having these law than just punishing, let's say, people that don't yeah. respect it. Because um, uh, social, cultural change or behavior change take time, and they will be met with resistance, especially when there's economical gains or like personal. People have to make personal change in their own lives. So there will be resistance. But by having a law, it does uh, create a new baseline of how we should act. It, it, yeah. it makes it official that we should act this way. So I think by that way, if, like some people will be more, uh, will be uh, sensible, uh, like uh, will be um, more aware of this problem. Some people might not even think about that ever. That's so by right. saying it, like making it into law, it will force some people to think about it, and so it could uh, by by yeah by creating a new baseline standard, it could change like individual behavior, and eventually individual behavior can drive uh, like the the production. Right, that's the, that's the hope. No Absolutely, that's the hope. I mean, you, arguably more important than having the right laws is having the right social norms. Um, there needs to be changes in, in social norms in this area because, I mean, my impression in Britain is that we're a nation of animal lovers. People feel very strongly that animals should not be harmed. But then people turn a blind eye to practices, particularly in the food industry. Uh, people would just rather not know what goes on. Um, and when it comes to things like decapods and, and fish, people rarely think about them at all perhaps because they assume they're not sentient without really looking into the evidence. And so in those areas, we need to change attitudes, need to change norms. Um, and you're right to suggest that in some cases, changes in the law, although justified on other grounds, could help in that process. It could sort of create a normative expectation. They tell you there's something wrong about your attitude of completely disregarding the welfare of crustaceans or fish. Kara uh, asked most of my question, but, uh, and you answered part of it, but I think it has to be asked more uh, stridently. 
this cost-effective clause is a mm. potential catch-22. And I'll give you a concrete example of it. Somebody mentioned before that you could have mischievous, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, pseudo-cost uh, arguments. Yeah. And they certainly happen. And, and by the way, to a certain extent, Diggles is doing that in his article. He's not talking about costs. But indirectly, he's saying, well, you can't do this to science, you can't do this to... Right, the yeah, the, the talk about the bureaucratic burden scientists would be placed under. But I'm going to give you a concrete example. And if, in fact, it's the one that Nicholas Morello had in the back of his mind, and it's one that Cara was involved in as well. And it's very re relevant to the... It's, and, and there's going to be a talk on this here. An example of how cost-effectiveness can be used nefariously. The new Quebec law says that you can keep on hurting animals for food, the food industry, you can keep on hurting animals for science, but that's it. You're not allowed to hurt them in other sectors. Mm. And so Professor Roy, who's going to be giving a talk here as well, uh, picked the rodeo as a, as a, as a flagrant example of another sector in which animals are being hurt. And the precautionary principle shouldn't apply because it says, you, according to the law, one of the clauses, you're not allowed to hurt them at all. And by hurt them, we mean harm their health. But of course, everything is a matter of evidence. I mean, what, uh, you're not allowed to kick an animal, but I mean, you can't be sure that kicking them is going to harm its health. You, you can't even be sure that it's going to hurt. It could be a very light kick. And so what, what's to be anticipated is that with all the wealth of evidence that we're going to hear here uh, Saturday night from, Professor, uh, from Dr. Konaboon, the rodeo industry is going to come back with a cost-effectiveness argument. They're going to say, this industry is going to cost uh, the loss of this industry is going to cost a great deal to Quebecers, a lot of re lost revenue, and lots of negative consequences because of that. It's not cost effective. We have to keep on having the Rodeo. What do you have to say about that? Right, yeah, I mean, a certain type of cost effectiveness argument is blocked, as I was emphasizing before, which is an argument that says taking any precautions to mitigate this risk at all would be too costly, so let's do nothing. The idea is that is blocked, and all that remains is discussion among different precautionary measures about which would be best. Um, I suppose your worry is that that might still leave room for someone to argue you know, there's some very, very light touch measure that we could take. And they'd argue that the very, very light touch measure is always more cost effective than the, than the more substantially risk reducing measure. Um, and that, that, is, that is a pitfall in this area. Right. And I think it is one of the things that this framework I proposed needs augmenting with. I mean, one of the things that needs to be added is, is a clear list of credible indicators, as I've said. I mean, I've not aimed to provide that. I've just said that this is something the animal sentience community should aim to agree on. And equally, I think, I mean, you've convinced me that what also needs to be added is some sort of clear framework for adjudicating debates about proportionality and cost effectiveness. What sort of considerations are legitimate? What sort of considerations are not? In the case of environmental law, there's a massive literature on proportionality, what a sort of proportional response to an environmental threat is. And I think there's no comparable literature on proportionality in the case of animal welfare, and perhaps there needs to be. Yeah, I think one more question. Okay, so in regard to your uh, common sense appeal, I'm wondering um, when you say, now that we say we have evidence that species or organisms are sentient, is it necessarily common sense or does it follow that it's an immediate threat, uh, as you put it, like threat to irreversible damage? Um, so what I mean to say is that some individuals might argue Mm. Sure, it's sentient, um, but does that mean it's a serious welfare concern, especially uh, if we view sentience on a spectrum where certain 
organisms feel to a larger degree than others. Um, I'm sure a common person might say, I'll agree with you that the shrimp feels pain, but I still don't think it's, it's that important and that big of an issue relative to other yeah. issues. And how would you respond to this other than saying, well, you're a monster or something like that, right? Well, I can point to the scale of these problems. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, I can absolutely see that uh, people will, might doubt the ethical significance of a harm inflicted on a shrimp. And then the thought is, well, remember it's not just one shrimp, it's trillions of shrimps. Um, there is a kind of aggregative thought there that, that that should worry you. The scale of the problem should worry you. That something that you might think, well, that's, that's not a big deal. Ethically, if inflicted on one animal, you should think, if we're doing this to trillions of animals, that's a more serious concern now. Um, and it's, it's, it, I admit it's possible that some people just might not be moved by that. But I think, I think people should be moved by that. Right. So other than, I, for example, when you talk about the magnitude, um, it can be irreversible if we start talking about species extinction. Yeah. But if we're just talking about these individual creatures suffering, do you have any other, like a stronger argument to convince right. people that they I should? I mean, my, my formulation of the precautionary principle uh, avoids irreversibility, which features in the, the Rio Declaration version, um, to, to try and sidestep the issue you're raising there about, you know, quite right to say if a species goes extinct, that's irreversible, but, uh, you know, cutting the eyes off a, off a shrimp is not irreversible in the same way. It's irreversible for the shrimp, um, but it's not raising a concern about species extinction. And so I, le I just leave out the term irreversible because I think it isn't necessary for a harm to be serious, serious enough to warrant precautions, that it also be irreversible. That's just a, a feature of certain types of environmental harm, but needn't be true of all serious harms. And the, I mean, support from that comes from the use of precautionary principles in public health policy, where there too the risks are not risks of irreversible damage because you know, the human species will probably survive even some sort of terrible pandemic. But nevertheless, we think it's appropriate to take precautions against that sort of pandemic. Um, yeah, I just want to respond to... Um... Yeah, this is the last question. <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to respond to what was being said about the rodeos and the fact that um, you know, this, this precautionary principle um, is applied to <clears throat> equine activities right now, um, especially the withdrawal of horse-drawn carriages in the legislation of the city of Montreal in the upcoming years, and um, the uh, proposal to ban rodeo activities in, uh, well, here in Quebec, um, and that the precautionary principle right now is being used um, to, like, either maintain or ban these activities based on this cost-effective clause that you're talking about. And I'm wondering um, how could this sort of be implemented in a way where um, it would only target suffering and it would target um, abuse without actually uh, withdrawing completely the activity because of, you know, the notions of, you know, partnership and pleasure, and we were talking about animal citizenship yesterday in uh, Christian's talk, and I'm just wondering, you know, how do you see, uh, especially, you know, you were saying coming from Britain, which is a particularly equine-friendly um, country and all that, and uh -huh. animal-loving country as well, how would it apply in the regulations, you know, there and here? Well, I, I quite agree that the Details will vary a great deal depending on the case and on the national context as well. Um, and I don't, you know, I know basically nothing about 
rodeo. And so I can only, I can't even really begin to comment on how effective safeguards on the welfare of the animals might be implemented in such a practice uh, without completely destroying the practice. All I can say is that in the case I focused on here, the case of decapod crustaceans, I just think there's some really easy, simple steps involving stopping what I see as you know, unnecessary and potentially seriously inhumane practices that we can just stop. I think in some ways that's, that's a simple case and I have a clearer grip there on what sort of precautionary measures would help. Yeah, because um, I don't remember, remember your name, but you were talking about uh, pleasure and some of these activities you know, are seen um, as non-suffering you know, activities and more like games and some, you know, there, there has been empirical evidence that you know, horses enjoy all kinds of different working uh, activities and husbandry activities and um, the, the cost effectiveness of taking all these animals away from different practices, whether it be like rodeos or pulling carriages and putting, uh, you know, healthy, uh, you know, well-functioning animals in refuges that uh, take the space of animals in precarious situation um, do cause an imbalance to animal welfare that is kind of blindsided by this abolitionist sort of yes or no principle, which is based on pr the precautionary stuff that you're talking about. So I was just wondering how it, it could be applied uh -huh. differently Do you want to, to larger animals. Sure. <coughs> oh, um, I, I can't answer her question, but I had another one, a related one. So. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I think we're out of time, right, unfortunately. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time. <laughs> but uh, thank you to all of our speakers. It was really a good talk. Thank you.